Hello again, I am Jim Bob, and welcome back to Lone Oak Farm. It's day five of autumn. We're into the closing stages of this particular season. And uh, as you can see, we are just arriving at our sheep farm. So once the camera stopped rolling last night, I finished working those uh, last remaining jobs. All the bales uh, that we made that were silage bales have been stacked up in piles. And we made uh, around 15, I think it was, hay bales as well, some of which... Uh, as you can see are here and some of which are in storage at the main farm and I've also brought back the 1455 that we were using yesterday as well now our sheep are in dire need of attention they are pretty much completely out of food so before we do anything else I need to very very quickly just scoop up whatever's sort of left in the uh, the mess area of the food trough get that into the trough as quickly as we can to stop them from having no food at all and then we can actually sort a proper bale out for them maybe even two bales let's give them a little bit of food right now just to get them going you can see how empty that trough is to drop that down a bit more there we go Appears to be all the grass. There might be a touch just there. I think I've got it. Ugh, it's so tight in here, it's very hard to move around. There we go. Right, so if we just pull up the animal information tab, uh, you can see they've actually dropped in health just a little bit. They're at 91% yesterday, so they should have been 92 today, and they've dropped to 89 because in the early hours of this morning they did actually completely run out of food. So uh, we managed to catch it before any serious damage was done, but uh, had we left that for another day, then we could have ended up losing actually quite a few sheep. So uh, we managed to judge that quite well in some respects. Let me just drop that off there. Let's grab our bale fork. Give them a full bale as well. See exactly how much that puts into the food trough. I wonder if I can possibly squeeze a second one in there. I might not. I might just wait. Uh, so, let's see. Yeah, we don't need a second one. That's a little bit too much at this stage. But I might still need to use this. So, in fact, I will still need to use that. So, we'll leave that there for a second. Oops. Forgot to leave the arms up or else you can't open the doors. <laughs> there we go. Uh, right, let's get the 1455 off the back here. We're going to hook up to the water trailer. In fact, I think that might be empty, actually. We might need to refill the water trailer. Oh, we never did test to see whether the first update actually fixed this water point here. I don't think it did, but we'll check anyway. Just to be on the safe side. Nope, it didn't. I didn't think it did. So, at least we know for sure. So we'll park this next to our fountain. Our uh, windmill there. There we go. Filling up quite nicely. Now we'll get this back in position. Ready for us to unload into our water trough. There we go. Right, so that's the sheep taken care of. Let's just move this in here. Park it right up against the uh, bay there, so out of the way. So we need to start sorting out these bales in here. So let's uh, just fold the back of the trailer up. I'm going to detach the trailer. unfold the bales and to make things a little bit easier on us when 
what I'm going to try and do is just take them off the back of the trailer with this and then use the uh, bobcat to manually transfer them into the shed where it's quite tight. So let's get these straps off. There we go. So we should be able to just auto load these off. There we go. And I'll stack them just here, out of the way. Ooh, yeah, a little bit too much weight. But unfortunately, you can't hook a trailer to the back of the weight, or you can't hook that trailer to the back of our weight. So I had to come without the weight this morning. It's not like the auto load bale trailer where we can connect that directly to the back of the weight. This one won't. So, as a result, we're kind of a little bit at the mercy of weight distribution. There we go. Okay, so, now we can move this out of the way. Just fold the forks back up again. Excellent stuff. Lights off, beacons off. Uh, now we need to start moving these in to the shed. This is where it's going to get tricky. Because I can only really do this one at a time if I want to keep good control. Well, I suppose I could go more, actually, because I can um, extend these forks, I believe. Uh, where's the help window? Close cover. There we go. That's what I was looking for. So this will actually allow me to pick up more than one bale and keep them pretty straight, in theory. Although it's a little bit trickier in practice. The great thing about the Bobcat, though, is that it is remarkably uh, heavy as a for a centre of gravity on this piece of equipment. It's got a very low centre of gravity. It's got a very uh, heavy weight rate. Um, weight figure so it can pick up and hold three bales quite comfortably as you can see we're not sliding all over the place we're not tipping forward like the puma does this thing has a very very heavy weight profile so this is where i need to be really careful because i need to uh, try and raise these up i want to try and double stack these got to be careful because of those fuel drums there I think I've got enough height to actually double stack these I hope I have enough height to double stack these let's try and get squared up so I'm a little offline at the moment you can see the bales are starting to move so let's just push these forward a bit try and square them back up again okay it's not perfect but it'll do Yeah, they're, they're threatening to wobble off, aren't they? So I'm going to have to be really careful with this. <laughs> Looks like somehow that bale has managed to go over the top of the forks. We can do this. We can get this where we need it. All right, there we go. Very nice. Slight, uh, slightly off centre here. Just going to lift these up a touch. Right at the very kind of height of my arms here. There we go, so it's a little wobbly, <laughs> but we got them in there, that's the important thing. The next stack should be much, much easier. But this just gives us a little bit more room to play about with, and also it's kind of future-proofing the concept of being able to get more than just nine bales in here as well for when our numbers increase next year. 
because uh, as soon as spring hits, those sheep are going to start breeding again. We got eight last year. Uh, I reckon we're probably on for at least ten this year coming, or this next spring coming. And that's assuming that we don't purchase any more sheep and add to our numbers. I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I want to save my money and invest purely in machinery and land rather than livestock this winter. Let's get this second stack in and positioned. Just ease the throttle back. When you have such a, a tight turning circle as well, you have to be really careful that, to really control your, your throttle. If you are really sudden, lots, you know, make some really sudden jerky acceleration or, or deceleration movements, then that can completely throw your balance off with the bales. There we go. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. I think. Uh, big question is, can I actually reach that top bale? Because there's no point having a bale up there if I can't reach it to then use it when I need it. Let's see if I can spike it. There is another set of forks that I might possibly look at getting. Uh, ones with telescopic extenders. But <clears throat> it looks like we can get away with it. So we'll take that one off the top of there. We'll stick it on the other stack instead, just to give us a bit more balance between the two. I keep spiking it as I try and pull the forks away. There we go. Right. So, uh, let's fold these up. Get the bucket reconnected and then we can park up the bobcat because we're done with that. We still haven't used that stacker, have we? Uh, might have to uh, just get rid of that if we're not going to use it at this rate. Otherwise we're just paying for a piece of equipment with our daily sort of uh, vehicle costs that's never getting used. What's the point of having it kind of thing if that's going to be the situation? So yeah, we may well get rid of that. I had planned on using it, but I think, you know, given our, our sheep numbers and how little food they're consuming, we just don't really need it. So a bit of a shame, but never mind. I'm sure at some point we might need a use for it. We'll, uh, we'll think about it. Let's get this door closed. Excellent. So the sheep are taken care of. Let's head back to the farm and we can start prepping for our corn chaff, which is going to be the main order of business today. Let me get the trailer hooked up. Let's uh, spin around in this spot here. And away we go. As we get back to the farm, you can see these are all the bales that we did that was stacked up. Let's just quickly jump out and uh, and see. So we've got one, two, three, four, five complete stacks of 24 bales. And then we've got a partial stack just around the corner. And you can see, if we start scanning these, you can see how far along they are in the ferment fermentation process. This one here is about a third of the way through. Uh, the bales in this stack are a little bit further along, 31 hours to go. We look at this stack here. We're at 30 hours. This one, we're at 26 hours to go. This stack here, 25, then almost halfway done. And this stack is halfway done, just over uh, halfway done. So a fraction under 24 hours to go until this one, this stack here is ready to be sold. So this means that we can actually start cherry picking stacks tomorrow and taking those down at random intervals, uh, which will help clear up, you know, uh, space for us to then add more bales in. But that's tomorrow. That's the final day. And, uh, you probably won't see a huge amount of that day. It'll more, 
kind of be uh, dealing with other stuff rather than the grass work because we've done an awful lot of grass work this year so let's get the trailer put away we'll get the rostal mash broken out and then we will start attacking our cornfields Okay, here we go, our first real run with the Rostal Mash. It's not a bad bit of kit, this. I do quite like this. I mean, it's uh, it's a little bit more basic and limited compared to some of the other forage harvesters that are out there. So the Big X 580, I think it's the most comparable one to this. Uh, then next one up you've got is the New Holland um, forage harvester. And then uh, the... Uh, the Big X 1100 is uh, like the daddy of them all and uh, the headers that go with them all have different working widths and uh, different working speeds as well this one can only chaff at 6 miles an hour whereas I believe uh, some of the larger versions can actually chaff at 9 miles an hour so a little bit faster uh, but 6 miles an hour is, uh, is a decent enough running speed for us I think uh, so We'll get this positioned on the edge of the field, and then there's a couple of things that we are also going to need to bring up. We're going to need to bring up the truck. And uh, we are also going to need to bring up our uh, our chasers. Now, I have gone ahead and uh, arranged uh, to lease a couple of uh, chasers to help us out on this. So let's get a worker set up on that, and then we'll get the equipment brought over to run this. And here comes the second part that we need. Uh, you may see something glinting in the rear view mirrors there, the side mirrors. Um, what I've done is I have leased two of these Massey Ferguson uh, sugarcane trailers because these are also very, very good for unloading chaff. So we pull alongside, our worker should automatically activate. There we go. So we match some speed. And there we go. We are off and running with our uh, with our corn chaff. On this very grey and miserable day. But the great thing with these two trailers is that uh, you know, we can take these as they are like this back to the farm and tip them in that way or we can unload them into the truck or um, and then come back and then take the truck down but what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and be a little bit clever so uh, I'm going to on this first run pull them with the puma uh, and then after that once I've unloaded them into the truck the truck itself is going to be pretty much full because these two have a 28,000 litre capacity so combined that's a little more than the truck can carry. That's 56,000, and the truck itself can only carry 47. Uh, but what I'm going to try and do is uh, then bring them back, hook them up to the chaffer, let that pull them while I then take the uh, take the truck back to the farm, unload that into the bunker. I'm just blocking our uh, harvester there. And that way it can carry on chaffing away for us while we're working at the bunker itself. That's kind of the plan. I don't know how well this is going to work. I've never tried doing it like this before. Um, so it should be quite interesting. Uh, but it does throw open the possibility of us maybe doing some manual uh, chaffing a little bit later on as well. So yeah, going to be kind of curious to see exactly how this all kind of shakes out. It's been so long since I used any of the sugarcane DLC. Uh, I figured we needed to use it somewhere, you know, <laughs> to justify the expense of paying for it. You know, uh, well, I say paying for it; it was included in my season pass. But 
you get what I mean. Now, if you've bought the sugarcane DLC and you haven't really, you know, used it that much because you don't like doing sugarcane or you find it too far too time consuming, it's good to know that there are other ways that you can use some of the contents. So, as you've already seen, I've already brought in the Stara um, cultivator so that we can use that when we buy it in new fields to uh, remove the plow state and put them straight into a cultivated state as well. Uh, so that's something that you can use you know, straight away. You know, the cedars are obviously universal, you can use those wherever you want. Uh, and these trailers are really useful as well. You can use these not just for, si uh, for sugar cane, but also for grass, for hay, for straw, for chaff. You know, for uh, I think wood chips as well. You know, for silage. There's, there's a few different things that you can use them for. So for actually, let's just, uh, let's just take a quick look. You can see here, they'll take sugar cane, straw, silage, wood chips, chaff grass and hay so yeah pretty much everything i just mentioned there um so it's great that they have that flexibility and that you're not limited to only being able to use these with the sugar cane itself you can use them with other stuff um so yeah there we go i may well look at getting larger versions of these going forward but for now we'll stick with these two we've just leased them just for the end of this year just to get these uh, these two fields done Okay, and now we have more in the trailers than our actual truck can handle. So uh, this seems like a good point for us to pull alongside the truck and start emptying. So let's select the front trailer. And these don't have the usual kind of tip mechanics. Uh, so this is all done with the analog stick. I'm hoping I'm close enough. No, I'm tipping on the floor. I'm tipping on the floor. <laughs> dear, dear. I really need to reposition the truck a little bit better next time. That was not one of my finest moments. Let's try again. There we go. Now we're getting it in the truck. So we're going to have a little bit of stuff we're going to have to scoop up afterwards. And there's the first one done. So the theory is now, uh, what I can do is, if I just try and reposition a little bit better for the second trailer, because I have a feeling that one's going to be a little bit harder. There we go. Uh, what, I, what I can try and do now is I can hook these back up to the back of our rostel mash, and that can carry on harvesting and chaffing away while we take the truck back to the farm. and empty this into the bunker. That's kind of the plan, so let's see if this is actually going to work. And then I need to remember to park that truck in a more useful position next time. So, if I just disconnect from that, move that out of the way. I need to jump in and fire the worker for a second, so I can uh, back up, connect to the trailers, now they should still have enough power to be able to pull both of these, despite the fact that it's it's harvesting away. And there we go. So whether or not it'll do both trailers or, or not, I don't know. It should do. It has uh, a very sort of good range on its overload pipe. And that gives us the time now to rush this back to the farm. And then when we get back, we should be pretty close. I hope. We should be pretty close to being able to unload and uh, run the next load back as well. So this is going to be the best way for us to do a near continuous operation, I think. There'll be a lot less brakes than you know if we were to run the truck up and then just use the truck, unload into the truck bring the truck all the way down here and then all the time we're back down here sorting out all this silage uh, and all this chaff our harvester is just sat idle on the field waiting for the truck to go back and now we don't have that issue so let's get kind of positioned where we want to I'm 
be right up close to the wall, but not, you know, so close that I'm scraping alongside it. Like that. That looks to be good. So, I want my cruise control set to 1 for this. And a nice, steady, continuous tip. Oh, I'm coming out the uh, the back, aren't I? Oh, I forgot about that. Okay, uh, let's stop. I messed up there. Uh, I need to change the tip side. Uh, there we go, tip side back. That's better. That's the speed I should have been tipping at, and the amount I should have been tipping in one movement. So my uh, careful attempt to have a very nice, clean, smooth row <laughs> completely destroyed straight away by tipping at, with the wrong grain door. But yeah, we've, we'll we'll uh, we'll adapt. We'll sort it out. So let's head back, see how much has been picked up. And uh, this means that we could probably just ignore, actually, the Magnum altogether and just run the Harvester and then pull the Harvester back. So you can see the first trailer looks like it's full already. Almost. Almost full. And now he's on to the second one now. That's awesome stuff to see. So, tell you what, let's jump in. Let's do a little bit of manual harvesting ourselves. Uh, switch it on to the harvester. There we go. And let's take a little in-cab ride while we do some chaffing. Really don't tend to do that much of this myself. That's a shame. Again, it's because I'm so used to, you know, having to do all my farming on my own that, you know, you try and find ways to streamline your processes so that you can get stuff done. And it does mean that you do miss out on some activities. You can see, I've <laughs> you can see I haven't exactly kept a straight line. Uh, and this is another reason why I don't tend to do stuff myself. Is I try and do it in cab and I just start weaving all over the place without even realising it. Uh, i tell you what, we're pretty close to being full, so I'm going to head back down, just grab these little bits that I missed here. Swing back around. What I'm going to do is just to give me a bit more turning room if I'm going to do any manual stuff, is I'm actually going to put a, a headland in along here. And I'll do the same probably at the other end as well. but definitely on this end. I do love watching the corn getting chewed through the headers, the teeth just pulling it through into the centerpiece there. Very awesome. Just ripping it out of the ground and feeding it into the harvester. some operating lights on as well and we are getting close to filling up we've got a 56,000 litre capacity across the two trucks or across, across these two trailers so we'll get to the end I think but I won't be able to get all of this in the truck as we've already seen uh, and there we go that is essentially full So let's go and manually tip these into the truck. And then we'll do the same again. We'll take the truck back to the farm. We'll get this back up and running on the field again. So we've got that continual operation going. And that should help speed this, uh, this corn chaff up immensely. And let's see if I can actually get it all in the truck this time. And not dump it all over the floor. You see we are struggling a little bit under the weight of these two trailers. Not the most powerful 
uh, forage harvester this. It is the weakest of the ones that we have available. You know, of the, of the proper full-sized forage harvesters. It's, you know, only got 200 and something horsepower, I think. Not particularly powerful when you compare it to something like the uh, the New Holland or even the Big X 1100. That thing's a monster. And who knows, we may possibly end up getting one of those in the future. But for now... The Rostel Mash is going to do us just fine. So there we go, tipping into the trailer. Managing not to spill it on the floor. Always a bonus. Drop that down. Could do with being a little bit closer. And we're not going to empty this trailer completely because we don't have the capacity in our truck. And this is another reason why I want to get a new trailer in the winter so that we can actually, you know, transport more uh, goods around per journey. There you can see we've already still got 9,000 litres left in that rear trailer. So that's going to speed up just how quickly this forage harvester is going to fill up. get it lined up there we go uh, and once again uh, we're going to go back and we're going to go make some tip uh, you know tip all this chaff into the silo into the bunker see how much we'll end up with at the end of this I'm going to jump ahead now quite a way because it's going to be a lot of basically just doing this uh, so <laughs> this could get boring very quickly so I'll jump ahead a bit uh, make some real progress and then uh, once we finish that first field I'll probably check in with you again and, uh, and see just how much we've got in the silo So I've just paid a trip to uh, Gavco at the BGA to pick up some new equipment. Uh, they've sold us a bucket and uh, this scoop at the back as well, this uh, leveling blade for silage. Uh, this is so that we can actually work our pit. It's almost completely full on the sort of first level now. Uh, so uh, we can either try and drive over the top of pre-existing chaff that we put in there or we can just start working it and pushing it back and then driving the truck in again I think we'll try and drive the truck over what we've got already if we can that might be a little tricky I'm not sure just how high up the wall we can go with the silage so um, we haven't even finished the first field yet it's close to being finished but it's not quite finished yet so I'm starting to wonder whether or not it's worth us perhaps uh, seeing if we can arrange for a, uh, a corn header for our combine to be delivered to, the, to, uh, to Manning's tomorrow and just work with what we have in the pit because we've got a fair amount in there already as I say I, I don't know if we actually need 
to do both fields with chaffing. I don't know if we're going to have the space for it. Now, next year, you know, we're not really going to do much in terms of baling for silage bales next year. Uh, we might do a little bit here and a little bit there, but primarily any silage that we need uh, or want to sell, we're going to do with loose silage at the BGA at Gavcos. So we could potentially look at selling off our bale wrapper over winter to raise some additional funds now that we've got a chaffer you know we've got a, a great way to make large quantities of uh, of chaff and silage as loose material the benefits of doing baling is that we get a fixed price when it comes to the bales and you know although the price does fluctuate a little bit you know uh, it'll stay the same you know for every single bale that you tip during that period whereas with loose silage if you uh, shovel it in bucket by bucket then the price goes down after every single bucket little by little by little to the point where you end up having crashed the market the alternative to doing it that way is to try and do it with um, conveyor belts which you've seen me do in the past on Big Bud Farm and uh, uh, way back on Drum Art Farm as well the original season of Fent Farm I, I did that as well, but this is the chaff that we have in here so far, as you can see. We're about halfway up the wall on the silage as to uh, how high I think it will go. I don't think it'll go too much higher than this. Uh, so, yeah, we are filling this up, and we'll finish this. You know, we'll finish this bottom layer quite comfortably with uh, the work that's being done on the rest of that little bit of field. And then for the second field, I don't know if the second field's all going to fit in there or not. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's an interesting decision to, to, to ponder while I run the next two tips. So I'm just going to park this here out of the way. Uh, and I bought the bucket for two reasons. Uh, one, just because we're going to need a bucket at some point going forward um, for general farm work and also here with the silage. And two, uh, we did spill some, if you remember. So we've got to go and uh, scoop all that up at the end as well. That'll be a couple of thousand litres or so on the floor that we'll need to collect. So let's make our way back over to the cornfield and uh, check on progress over there. Here you can see our worker hard at work running up and down the field. This is what we've got left. We've still got a fair bit left. We've done quite a bit as you can see. So if we pull up the map you can see we are in the final quarter of the field now. We've done three quarters of it already as our truck parked up ready and waiting to be tipped into. Uh, and we still have a you know, <laughs> second field to do. And like I said, I don't know if we're going to have space for that field at all now. So I think what we're going to need to do is... Actually, I'm going to need to tidy up just here. Let's take control. Back up a little bit. Let's get that a little bit there. Let's get this bit over here. And then we'll get it started back up and down again on the other side. Uh, I have gone in a couple of lines already on the end. So... Uh, it's not all the way to the edge of the field. There is a, a couple of uh, passes worth on the far side that have already been done. As I try to uh, put that headland in, I need to remember to actually get this bit on the end here as well. Let's do that now. And there you can see what I've already done on the other side of the field. There we go. So... Uh, not a huge amount left, but as I say, this is easily, comfortably going to uh, fill up those last two bits on the ground level of our bunker. And then it's a question of do I try and double stack or do I just leave it at that and then harvest this remaining field tomorrow as quickly as we can. And actually get some grain out of it. I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to get in touch with Mannings. Um contact Sam the manager and see if he can arrange for a header to be delivered be it either a case header or a case R header whichever he can get you know at short notice for me uh, we'll have to pay for that what's our financial situation looking like uh, we are currently five hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in debt thanks to having to spend money on the bucket and the uh, and the and the silage blade as well plus keeping some operating capital. So the money we made yesterday has been swallowed up pretty much effectively. We're about 490 this morning. And that's, as you can see, it's gone. So yeah, uh, I think that's what we'll do. Uh, I think we'll uh, arrange for a, a header to come. And then if 
yeah, we'll start harvesting early in the morning. We'll turn it, get as much grain off the field as we can. And then if it starts to rain, then, you know, we'll obviously have to sort of call it a day and pack it in. But we can then bring the chaff out and we can chaff whatever's left over so that the crop doesn't wither when we hit the first day of winter. You know, we'll actually be able to take it off the field in some shape or form tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to, with the next trailer that I take back to the bunker, I'm going to stop off in the office and I'm going to contact Sam at, uh, at Manning's and ask him to deliver you know or get hold of a header as quick as you can for me to, for tomorrow morning yeah put it on express order uh if it means i have to pay a little bit extra then so be it but we'll do that and then we'll try and harvest that as actual grain that second field and then as i say if rain stops play we'll go back to chaffing the second field Onto the very, very last little bit of this field now. Just got this thin strip here and then a little bit of tidying up to do in a couple of spots. Uh, but this field is now finished. Uh, so it's going to be a decent haul of chaff. I'm not sure the exact amount yet. I still haven't checked to see how much we actually have in the bunker. But we've made quite a few trips with the truck. I would say we've made nine trips, maybe ten so far so we're looking at close to half a million liters of chaff uh so that's that's a lot of silage <laughs> considering that's mainly going to be just for our cows when we bring cows in next year we may sell a little bit of it here and there but that's essentially that's going to be our uh, our silage for making tmr so that's quite a lot that's uh that's a really really good haul and it indicates that over the two fields, we could easily come away with a million litres, uh, which is uh, you know, quite a large amount, you know, in terms of if we wanted to sell it all, that's a lot of money. So I think we are going to make the right decision by uh, actually harvesting as much of that corn as we can tomorrow. I have been on the phone with, uh, with Sam at Manning's and uh, he has enabled, you know, been able to guarantee me a header. I don't know which one it's going to be yet. He says he's, uh, he's going to have to pull a few strings, but he will guarantee that a header will be available for us tomorrow. It might not be the right size. It might be a little bit too small. You know, he'll do what he can, but it's, you know, it's really short notice for, for him to have that there first thing tomorrow for us. So we'll just have to, you know, muddle along as best we can with whatever header we can get so it could be a long day of harvesting ideally if we can get something that's a nine meter width that would be uh, ideal but i got the feeling that you know if we can get a nine meter header we're going to be very very lucky indeed i think we're probably looking yeah maybe a, a six meter i hope it's not a three meter that would <laughs> that would really be a little bit of a kick in the teeth a because we had a couple of those and we sold them to case earlier in the year when we uh, took ownership of the 7130 in that part exchange deal uh, and secondly you know a three meter working width means it's going to take forever to harvest that field uh, in which case we are almost certainly going to have problems with the rain uh, which is not good at all so yeah it'll be interesting to see exactly which header sam's able to uh, obtain for us hopefully as I say, hopefully it'll be six or nine meters. We can work quite comfortably with either of those two working widths. Nine meters would be better, but we'll settle for six. So let's get this back to the farm. We'll get it put away for the night. I'm going to hold on to these. These are leased. So we are paying for these every hour of use that we get out of them. That's another reason why our money went down quite quickly from the money we uh, saved last night. Uh, is because, you know, these have been used for over an hour now. So that ticked in additional leasing costs but we'll hang on to them overnight just in case we need them tomorrow you know, because of the weather change and if we don't yeah, then we can re return them at the end of the day and uh, maybe look at a more permanent solution for next year we'll see how things shake out but uh, yeah time for us to bring that last load of chaff over to the BGA to our well, to the bunker here at the farm We'll get all that in, then we'll start compacting and uh, levelling off the chaff that we have in the bunker.
So the boys have put twins back onto our magnum for us. We're going to use this to compact the bunker. Uh, I did a little bit of checking once we'd uh, scooped up the last little bits that we spilt and uh, got that final trailer tipped and unloaded. We have 510,000 litres uh, and a little bit of change on top of that as well. So uh, almost 511,000 litres of chaff in the bunker. That's a very, very nice amount of silage that we're going to have. So now it's time for us to start uh, compacting that. Yeah, that truck's a bit too close. Let's just move that a bit further away. So I've got a little bit more room at the entrance to the bunker there. There we go, that'll do. Let's start compacting all of this down. And seeing just how much we've got. I'm going to put the cruise control way down so we've got nice slow speeds. And... Uh, my wheel's caught on the wall there. So. Let's unfold. Our silage uh, spreader. And slowly. Try and level this out and start compacting it down. This is going to take the rest of the day, I think. Uh, so what I'm going to do while I'm doing this is I'm also going to send the Puma over to the sheep farm with some uh, skinny wheels attached and the weeder. And I'm going to get the uh, grass field there weeded so that it hits its final stage of fertilizer because that's at stage two at the moment. And that'll get that prepped ready for some more baling tomorrow and I'm gonna get the baling done first thing in the morning off camera so it'll be sort of late in the day uh, I'll, uh, I'll get a, a head start on the baling uh, and then when we went actually start we'll probably probably be at the point where we're selling some stuff at the BGA so just make a little bit more progress here with this next pass Seeing how high up the back wall it can go. That's that's pretty high actually. A little bit higher than I thought it would go. Let's try and level this bit out a bit as well. I say we've got a fair bit of compacting that we need to get done going to take quite some time to get all of this nice and level and nice and compacted uh, so it's, like I said I'm going to be pretty busy actually one thing I do want to check as well is um, if I just jump out for a second are we spilling out the sides we've seen this as a problem on quite a lot of bunkers on a lot of different maps over the year over the last 18 months where silage and chaff has spilt through the walls and I'm really impressed with this. Look at this. Not a single bit is showing so far. I mean, obviously, there's still some more work to do, but there is absolutely zero spillage showing on this bunker here. Let's check the uh, sidewall over here. Yeah, nothing. Look, it's it's absolutely pristine. I'm really impressed with that. So uh, they've done a really, really good job with the coding on this thing. You can see, actually, it doesn't go quite all the way flat to, and flush to the wall because of the way that the uh, mechanics have been done to stop it from seeping through but uh, yeah really really good job on the bunker here well it turns out this field hasn't grown another stage yet this grass is still sort of uh, stage two uh, and therefore can't be weeded up to stage three yet so I think that means that grass might not grow tomorrow. I think it might only be, it might it might have reached that point where it stops growing. I wonder if that is actually the case. Hmm. Means that we're probably going to end up with a very sort of disappointing cut tomorrow, potentially. You see that sunset over there. Oh, this map does look so beautiful. But, uh, 
at all times of day with the, the sunlight coming through the trees and the headlights and you can see the lights on in the buildings. Oh, it's truly stunning. Um, yes, so uh, <laughs> if that's the situation and we can't weed it, then we're not looking at 100 bales on that field tomorrow. We're looking at maybe 60 bales on that field tomorrow, somewhere in that kind of region, which is a lot less than we're expecting. In which case, I'm trying to think, I think I might be able to do all of those bales in one go. I've got 129 silage bales. I've got, let's see, I've got 10 hay bales with the sheep and I've got another 15 straw bales. That's 25. So that puts us at a 146, 140, no, 144, 154. Uh, and that, yeah, so I'm not going to get them all done but I'll get half of that field bailed before I hit the bail limit. So if I crack on with that first thing in the morning, while I wait for that header to be uh, delivered to Mannings, you know, uh, get up at like three or four in the morning and do my bailing then, assuming the weather's good, of course, then uh, I can get all of that done out of the way. And then once, you know, we get later into the day, we can sell a couple of these batches of bales that we have on our farm then we can you know, finish the rest of that field off and make the, the final batch of bales, which will then sell off midwinter. I'm also hoping as well that we might possibly be able to sell some crop tomorrow uh, as we're getting into a really good window for wheat and barley and we have plenty of both to sell. So it just may be that we can actually make a serious amount of money tomorrow, which is good because I'm looking on the first day of winter to start negotiating land deals with nearby farmers and uh, acquiring some additional fields. So that's kind of what's gonna be the plan for tomorrow then. We'll get an early start. We'll, uh, we'll get some baling done off camera so that when you guys come in, we can uh, start harvesting the corn. We can also start selling some silage bales and uh, maybe sell some grain and hopefully raise a nice bit of cash. So that's it from me. Thanks for watching. I am Jim Bob and I'll be back with the next episode of Lone Oak very soon.